Alright, welcome back everybody into another lecture. Today's topic will be identify hazards, assess and control safety risks. The unit code is SITXWHS002. Now, throughout this lecture, you're more than welcome to pause the video in sections and come back to it as we go. We'll be going through all the slides today and if uh, you have any troubles at any point, you're more than welcome to come back to it and revise at any point. So let's not bore you any further, let's get into it. Alright, so essentially when we're talking about identifying hazards, it's anything you know uh, to do with any problems or any in you know obstacles that may get in the way of you or anybody working with or alongside you at your workplace so you know you might every day when you come in especially if it's a rapidly changing work environment um, maybe such as a uh, a shopping mall or a let's say a, a entertainment venue or a sporting uh, theater you know, there's people coming and going and things are changing all the time, there's rubbish created, so you're always having to do, you know, a hazard analysis and a risk assessment of the area to see, okay, um, what's wrong, how can we eliminate it and then make it safe enough for people to come in. So 1.1, access and use hazard identification and risk assessment tools and template documents. So, like again, it's identifying what a hazard is, so it's something that has the potential to harm a person uh, hazard in tourism, travel, hospitality and event sector may include sharp tools, hot equipment, moving vehicles, chemicals, electricity, working at heights, etc. So anything that might be able to cause harm to anybody at the premises. Risk, uh, the possibility that harm might occur when people are exposed to hazards. So any harm, it could be little or a lot, so it could range from a small little cut to a you know person ultimately dying which is the most serious risk of all so moving forward when you are going to be assessing a hazard you're going to have it to give it a rating and you're going to have to kind of identify what the possible risks could be for that hazard that is present and if it's too risky you'll need to identify how you can eliminate or stop it from being um, you know any further or riskier any further and how would you you know use those preventative measures to do that uh, risk control like I said taking action to eliminate health and safety risks so far as is reasonably practicable so if, you know you could say okay I'm going to eliminate sharp knives but think about it if you are working in a restaurant how can you eliminate knives you need it to cut things, chop things, even customers need knives to cut steaks, the food on their plates, so you can't really eliminate, you know, the knife. But you can put in procedures and training for your staff t in, in practice so that they can, you know, use knives in a safe manner so they don't get hurt and the risks aren't as much, um, you know, present as they would be for people who aren't trained in those things. Okay, so if this is impossible, then you should minimize the risk. So far as reasonably practicable, eliminating a hazard will also eliminate any risks associated with the hazard. So reasonably practicable, deciding what an action is reasonably practicable to protect people from harm. Um, this requires taking into account and weighing up all relevant factors. So you're thinking about, is it possible financially? Is it possible, you know, by technology, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to uh, have a knife that has a switch and then when it's pressed, it becomes sharp and then when it's pressed again, it becomes dull. You know, it might not be possible with the current technology that is in, you know, present. But if you say, okay, we've got a TV on a stand, has no place for it, people can just knock into it, okay, let's make a cupboard so that it's not easily accessible and it's in a, um, in a section or in a place of the venue where it's safe 
and can, can only be accessed by the proper personnel. So it's things like that what you can do instead of removing that issue completely let's let's try and think about what is the most logical way of getting rid of it as quick as possible. Hazard tools and template documents um, so yeah so we got self um, design tools so you could essentially create one yourself uh, there's many online sources where you can just download tools they're pretty free there's not you know you can get one from the Food Authority website from um, Safe Work there's so many um, and they're basically they've got all the information that you need to put in there so it's not a requirement that you might need to add anything but if you deem that it is you know required for you to add certain things you're more than welcome to edit the templates okay so templates might be developed by external consultancy services industry associations for use by member businesses for public use and found within business management publications including those developed by work and health safety government regulators so all that encompasses everything that I talked about tools developed for organization as part of the work and management safety system so you might have an online system a training system and a mandatory um, you know thing that comes with your HR where everybody has to follow the steps and essentially you're just putting that into a computer software program that's got all those sections for you to fill up if something happens so it's just a lot easier that way instead of having up you know a big booklet pulling that out or photocopying it and then starting over you can just pull up the app or open up the computer and then input all of your required information all right so activity 1a specify three types of hazard identification and risk assessment tools and template documents um, and specify four occasions on which particular care should be taken during the management of work health and safety risks so we're thinking about three types of hazard identification and assessment tools and template documents so for this case this could be tools designed by you uh, tools that you've got on another company to design and um, templates you found off government agency websites or things that you know your company has developed themselves so there's many places where you can get these documentation it's um, you know you just have to understand if it fits you and if it's uh, if there's a bit of editing required you know you're more than welcome to do so to include all the information that you need to include uh, four occasions um, on which particular care should be taken you're thinking about okay um, health and safety um, are we doing proper health and safety audits are we doing uh, proper equipment training um, what about um, you know let's say how do we improve our waste management and um, how to increase workflow things like that so in between uh, you know we're identifying what are the hazards how can we improve those um, or eliminate them altogether so we're thinking about those things in that response there so write those things down and whatever you think is also fitting for those questions when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll be going on to the next one. Okay, hopefully so you've done that. Let's move on to the next one. 1.2, use appropriate methods to identify actual or foreseeable hazards that have the potential to harm the health and safety of workers or anyone else in the workplace. Um, so usually, you know, what is generally associated with the workplace, you know, you've got physical work environment, the equipment, the materials, any substances that you're using, um, the work tasks that may be involved and performed in the kitchen, any design flaws or any you know management processes that might be flawed. So think about you know if we're talking about cooking, there's so many hazards involved in that situation. If you're thinking, okay, um, cooking, you're always having um, 
you know, open flame, hot oil, uh, heat. So all these things, how can we rectify? So if you're thinking about uh, open flames, you know, making sure that we're always paying attention. We can't really get rid of flames, okay? Instead of using flames, you might be using induction cookers, which will be expensive. Um, they're not as effective as um, gas, uh, but, you know, they are safer. It's just how much investment, you know, do you want to move forward with? How much money do you have to do those type of changes? So... You know, you're you're having to consider your processes. Think about people that use tandoors. It's, you're putting your hand in a hot oven. You know, 250 plus 300 degree oven, and you're just quickly putting your hand in there. And you know, you're going to get all the hair on your arm. It's all going to get burnt. And if you're not okay with heat, you're not really going to be able to withstand that. So, how do you eliminate that? You know, maybe you have a top skillet that gets really hot and then, okay, maybe you put your naan on top of that skillet that's non-stick, kind of replicating the clay. Yeah, but still, how hot, you know, where's the heat over the top? So it's really hard to replicate the tandoor. So people who are really skilled, you might consider hiring them compared to just hiring any random chef who doesn't really have the experience, okay? So appropriate hazard identification methods include conducting a uh, site safety audit, completion of safety checklists, inspections of the workplace, observation of daily activities, investigation of accidents and incidents, review of injury or illness registers. Uh, these things, you know, you, you've got to set them on a schedule because they are a lot. It's a lot. The bigger your company, the bigger the venue, the more these things build up and you might get audited if somebody gets hurt you're in trouble so now you know if somebody's getting in trouble who's the guy responsible if it's you you're going to be in big trouble so make sure if it's part of your job figure out what the correct time is what you know when is it appropriate for you to do these tasks if you require a bit more time than your normal work schedule you need to talk to your manager and see, okay, I need more time to do these through the month or the week or even the day of my venue. So some places that are so big, they might just have one person doing all of these tasks for the venue every day because there's so many people going in and out and there needs to be a person making sure that these things are all a-okay and that people aren't getting hurt. Appropriate hazard identification methods include environmental monitoring of the workplace, investigation of staff complaints or reports of safety concerns, review of staff feedback via consultative processes such as meetings, surveys or suggestion box submissions. So I always say have an open you know, communication with the people that you work with, your boss, your colleagues. Everybody, if you talk to each other, then it, you'll all you know, everything comes out ultimately. People don't want to stay quiet if it's bothering them. So make sure that they are allowed to talk in a meeting, that, you know, they don't feel like if they say something wrong that they will have repercussions, you know. So have open communication, be able to kind of listen actively. Don't just nod your head and say, yeah, we'll see how we can. No, ask them questions about it. Why, when did this happen? Uh, why is it happening? Is it specific to you or does it happen to everybody? So if you know these details, you'll be able to see, okay, um, if you've got John, who's seven foot one, and he's saying, oh, I, whenever I walk in through the front gate, I always hit the, the entrance beam. Okay, so most people aren't seven foot one. So if it's only happening to him, maybe we create a solution around him and not try and eliminate the door completely and say, okay, we're going to have a 10-foot door. If that's more expensive, it's much more easier to put some reflective tape so it makes it more aware for John to not hit his head than to try and get in workers, um, eliminate that um, you know, hazard 
by spending thousands of dollars just for one person. So you've really got to think about it. Use common sense. See what you can do to rectify it. All right. Activity 1B, for each of the following types of workplace, please state which methods uh, for identifying um, hazards might be appropriate. So we've got hol uh, workplace, uh, holiday park, bar and nightclub, travel agent's office, and touring coach. So we essentially want to highlight um, which method for identifying hazards might be appropriate for this. So if it's a workplace, um, you know, are you, you know, conducting site safety audits, right? It's your site, um, it's open, okay, no problem. Uh, do you have a checklist, you know? So those, if you're working at all of these things, right, you could choose from anything. But you know, think about, um, what about a holiday park, right? So you're really going to be considering the environmental aspect of it. So you might need a environmental monitoring, you know, process for that holiday park because you've got nature, you might have animals, you might have, you know, free roaming areas. So how did, how do those things affect your customers and the workers at your place. Think about bar and nightclub, you know, we're thinking about what incidents may happen and it's not more as in what may happen but what can happen and how we're going to control it because bars and nightclubs, people are going to get silly and there's going to be accidents. So what steps are we going to take to prevent those types of accidents? Most bars will intentionally make their floor sticky just so people don't slip. Uh, people spill their drinks all the time, so that adds to it, but they'll keep their floor a bit sticky just so that people have a bit more grip on those floors. Uh, it's, you know, differs from place to place. This is just um, what I've experienced, but most upscale bars, uh, they already have a high level of hygiene, their clientele is different, but, you know, some lower scale places, they don't have all the finances to go through proper hygiene control. So it's already kind of at the bare minimum standard for the government. So they're already at a, at a low level place. So they might be considering um, an injury or illness register and what's happening at their nightclubs, you know. Uh, travel agents and touring coach, uh, you know, you're really thinking about how will we, you know, investigating customer kind of feedback it's a lot to do with customers and um, thinking about complaints and consulting processes with you know your potential customers thing people who you're taking out on trips things like that make a list of five hazards which can exist in the workplace for each hazard please explain the harm that could be caused so let's see if we're thinking about uh, heavy machinery you know with with our hospitality background you've got hot you know hot machinery sharp it might cut people it might burn people might fall on people's toes crush bones let's think about chemicals uh, you've, you know, you're using heavy chemicals for cleaning, degreases for, you know, your cooking equipment. So all these things might have bad effects on the lungs for people, causing, you know, ill health and, you know, future conditions. So how are we going to rectify that? Okay, we're going to use a uh, biodegradable food grade cleaner. Okay, so it's just how you're going to... Uh, what do you foresee happening in those situations and how can you change it? So think about um, in our kitchens, we're always going to be hot. Okay, so how do we lower that? Okay, yeah, we can't have open windows, but maybe we can have an AC, um, lower the temperature. You know, we don't get vermins, but maybe we can still make it cool enough for people to not get dehydrated and get heat exhaustion and then not be able to work. So we're thinking about those things. Um, heavy noise, you know, in the kitchen you've got these exhausts and machinery always creating noise. So how do you do that? Maybe eliminate some noise, use some sound deadening material, things like that. So list 
uh, five and then give me the potential harm for those and once you finish with it come back to me unpause the video and then we can move on to the next one okay so 1.3 we've got work alone so 1.3 work alone or with other personnel to identify hazards so you're working in a team you might have a specified group if you're a big company that you might have a meeting time where you go around and identify these hazards every month or every two months or every week even depending on how big your company is and then you know moving forward you guys will consult with each other and upper management to see how you can remove you know these problems uh, working alone gives you a freedom and flexibility which is not always present when working with others you can decide how you do things and in what order unfortunately there are drawbacks to working alone you may not observe all the hazards that are present you may not spot something and be undecided as to whether or not it presents a risk you may miss out on an area of the workplace and then uh, those people that work there are at a risk and there's so many others that go along with it it's just a few um, but one thing with working alone is you don't have other opinions and you know many brains are much better than one so if you can work together and work with a lot of people as long as your end goal is the same if you can have a civil conversation and decide on what to do I think it will get solved a lot quicker than just working by yourself working with others open lines of communication are essential when working with others you have to take an assertive approach and actively point out hazards. Conversations about workplace risk are far easier when there is a shared commitment to the maintenance of health and safety. So like I said before, we need a shared goal, we need a shared endpoint, and we need to know how we're going to get there and how quickly we can get there. If, you know, if it's a money thing, then it gets, you know, cloudy. If it's a responsibility thing or a credit thing that okay I've done this and you're doing that so I need more recognition than you it will become a problem why because we need to have the ultimate goal in mind we need to make the workplace safe it's not about recognition and then somebody dies because you didn't get recognized for removing the ladder so you didn't mention it and then somebody dies and because the ladder fell on their head well great now you've got that in your conscious so you, d you don't want to you know have those things in your mind let's let's get the big picture in mind first let's make it safe for everybody to work together okay so activity 1c identify three drawbacks associated with attempting to identify hazards alone so we mentioned you know working by yourself might leave you know things out of your um, vision that you might see or you might not be able to see and then those things aren't identified for let's say another month or two months which might be on your schedule and then that's a big issue because now you have to come back and solve it again another thing might be you know you there might be various solutions out there but because you are by yourself you're only your mind is only working one way so you're only thinking about one possible solution and there might be easier solutions which you could have consulted with your other colleagues to find but you're working by yourself and you've only got that one thing so you've got a narrow kind of possible solution kind of box there um, another drawback could be essentially you're missing out on potential um, you know future hazards you know or the perspective of others on current hazards maybe like I was mentioning before if uh, John is seven foot one but you're only six foot and opening a door opening that's seven foot doesn't really matter but to John it does and he's the only one in on the team and he's always walking into it so if you include him in the process he will be able to share those ideas with you who else might you work with to identify hazards in your workplace? We're thinking about managers, other people of 
um, understanding, who have the same level of experience, um, people in different sections um, who might have been working there f for quite a long time and then they can identify most of the hazards with you. Uh, and people who put their hands up. Really, this is a team effort. We need everybody involved, ultimately, and if everybody can join in to identify what the problems are, and if we can help solve the problems together, it helps everybody, so nobody's at risk. It, this health and safety is not a one-person issue, it's everybody. Right. 1.4, keep records of identified hazards according to organizational procedures. Uh, this is more about doing your records, making sure that they're in place so if things do happen, you've got you know, the documentation in place so somebody can come in, check what's up, when you identified it, was anything done, um, if you, you know, why you neglected it if, if it was neglected and obviously if you don't have it, you didn't do these you know, mandatory things that you have to in the workplace, so you're obviously in, in breach of these uh, so, if you don't have these in your workplace, in a secured place where anybody can find them, it's going to be hard for you, especially if somebody gets injured. So, you know, you want to have your control measures in place in those documents. You want to think about how you're going to implement and monitor these measures, who you're going to consult with, the you know, what sort of training you've done at the workplace and any further changes you want to make in the future. Uh, you also want to remember that when, you know, which records you should complete and when. Uh, think about what the schedules are for those, uh, where you're going to keep them, if they're completed correctly, if you're doing it for the first time, maybe have a manager who's done it before observe you so he can kind of um, push you to the like the correct um, kind of way and the process that you need to follow what to do with completed records so obviously file them away make sure they're signed off by the proper authority in your workplace and then they're put in the proper place where everybody can access them activity 1d why is it important to keep records of identified hazards you know we're thinking about you know is it a legal issue um, is it a audit issue is there a person that's going to come in and judge us on how we've done it is the you know is it a work task for us is it involved in our work tasks um, have we've done and something new in the in the environment that we need to assess you know things like um, have we made what decisions were made what rectifications were made how we treated the had the hazard things like that and um, obviously keeping records in a secure place that's central allows everybody to access it so that's important as well okay so in this one you'll need to collaborate with somebody and you'll need to design a document for recording identified hazards you should complete this document during a routine inspection of your workplace so if you're in the kitchen you're thinking about okay what is a hazard that i've found you will need to consider these things maybe you know you want to put date like when it happened the time so let's say the 1st of March 2020, um, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, where it happened could be in the Wiseman kitchen, what was the, the hazard identified, could be that there is a knife um, that is broken, um, and essentially if um, a worker goes and uses it, the handle is broken so it's, they're going to stab themselves. Uh, what you did, so you threw the knife away. Uh, who signed for it? Okay, the manager approved the disposal of the broken knife. Okay, um, file that document away. So just type that up or write it in your logbook in a 
you know, at least a format that could be understood. And then finish those questions up and then unpause the video when you're ready. Alright, 2.1, access and use risk assessment tools and templates um, for doc like so documents that you're going to be using, the severity of the risk, so how risky is it, you've got a scale, you know, how what the risks will be, so it could be minor cut to severe death, things like that on a scale, whether or not the existing control measures are effective, so have you already had some sort of rectifying measures in place was it effective why not now what do you need to do from learning from that previous action what are you going to move forward doing what actions are you going to take so uh, how urgently are the actions needed to be taken is it an immediate solution that's required can you quarantine the place until the solution is possible you know using as much detail as possible on the documents will really help kind of clear, um, creating a vision for the person reading it. <sighs> a risk assessment should be completed when? Uh, there is uncertainty about how a hazard may result in an injury or illness. Um, the work effect activity involves a number of different hazards and there is a lack of understanding about how the hazards may interact with each other or to produce new greater risks changes at the workplace occur that may impact on the effectiveness on the control measures so these essentially what they're saying is if you're not sure you need to if you don't know what's going to happen you need to do a risk assessment if you're doing a new task or you have put in new equipment or some sort of new procedure in the workplace you need to do a risk assessment if you're you know if you've already done one and it hasn't changed and then there are so many different sections and everything's going to come together and ultimately there's going to be multiple risks so you need to jot them down and see how you know one can escalate the other and what the ultimate risks will be all right so 2a identify three situations in which risk assessments should be completed what risks um, uh, what risk assessment tools and template documents are used in your organization so this could be in your case let's say um, you know when you're uncertain about what the risk should be so you don't know what it will be so you need to do a risk assessment you'll need to identify what the risks could be what the range of um, the severity of it will be um, if there's new work of activities introduced or procedures if there's new equipment so any anything that's new you know and affecting your workplace you'll need to do a risk assessment um, what tools make you know you've got your checklists um, your guidelines your code of practice what else um, any organizational standards and procedures that might be in place so you're considering all of these before you're kind of completing your um, template or tool that you're going to be using. Okay. Alright, so complete the ant activity there. When you're ready, unpause it and come back and we will move on to the next one. 2.2. Work alone or with other personnel to use systematic methods to assess the risk. So when you're participating with a group, it's really interesting because you've got more ideas floating around but it also can be a bit annoying you know you've got many personalities within the group some people like to take control and if you're not the one that you know is given the control and then there's somebody else trying to take it from you it can get a bit uh, convoluted in how people are going to follow who they're going to follow but ultimately this task isn't about leadership in the sense that there's only one person that everybody's answering to. For safety, everybody needs to be accountable. So you've just got to remind that to everybody. You've just got to tell everybody, look, ultimately, this is for everybody. This is not just for you. Doing a good job means everybody's safe. So understand the nature of the risk that you're assessing. Um, become familiar with the documents and processes that you're going to be using to assess these risks 
Uh, don't be afraid to kind of, you know, voice your opinion uh, about the nature of the risk associated with specific hazards that you're going to be picking up. Making sure that they are heard by the others in the group, and then you're talking about it, making, you know, picking out what the problems could be, and then trying to brainstorm with future sort of solutions that you could come up with. Systematic methods of risk assessments include identifying the injury, illness, or other consequences that may occur as a result of exposure to the hazard. Determining the level of exposure, estimating the probability that an accident or injury will occur. Determining an overall risk level for the identified hazard. Okay, you can rate the likelihood um, as one of the following. Okay, certain to occur, uh, expected to occur in most circumstances, and there's very likely, will probably occur in most circumstances, possible might occur occasionally, unlikely, could happen at some time, or rare, may happen only in exceptional circumstances. So you've got those five categories there, uh, and you're going to be putting your risks that you find in those five categories. So, like I was talking about with John, he's seven foot one, you know, for most, let's say, if we've got 50 staff, it's going to be unlikely that all of those staff members will have an issue with the door opening. So we still need to s solve that problem, but it's unlikely that everybody will have a problem with it, or anybody in the future will. But let's say if it's a sharp object, it's and you've got all personnel touching that, yes, somebody is going to get cut, and it's very likely that it will happen. Right, activity 2B, how would you deal with the following situations while taking part in a group assessment? So you have an important point to make, but others are not involving you. So, you know, you, you don't want to be working in a place that doesn't listen, right? But in this case, you want to be kind of vocal. You want to make sure you've thought about what you're going to be saying. Okay, and then when you're speaking up, make sure everybody's giving you the space obviously and if everybody's not allowing you pick the leader okay once they are giving you their their attention then everybody else will follow in suit okay make your points with you know logical reasons and back them up and then essentially that's that's what's going to save you all right next one you keep trying to make suggestions but uh, one person in the group talks over you all, um, all the time. So you've really got to wait till they finish. Every time they overtake you, okay, let them. Let them. Uh, let's see how long they can talk. Once they're done, you know, bring forth your point because there's no point really going into an argument with them. Once they're done, let them finish, and then you know, tell us or tell your group what problems you think might arise. Uh, whenever you say something, the conversation just moves on as if you hadn't spoken at all. So, if you're talking about, let's say, in a group setting, and they're not really giving you that respect, it really depends on, are you, if you think your ideas are backed up with logic and they make um, sense, and they have good evidence and their common uh, common sense approaches you know your team members should be listening to you but sometimes you don't really get the right amount of respect so what do you do approach the leader talk directly to them see what's up why aren't they doing what they should be doing and if this can this attitude can change in the future okay uh, you are never allowed to finish making your points as someone always interrupts you. So in this case, if they're always interrupting you, there might be some sort of rooted issue there. So wait for them to finish or ask them, okay, when? let me know when you're done and then I can move forward with my points. And then when they allow you to speak, you know, speak with conviction, with 
you know, the right knowledge, the right evidence. Think about what you're saying. Is it you, are you using common sense ideas? All those things. How would you approach a situation in which you and a colleague disagree about risk assessment? Okay, so this is very much about conflict, right? If there's a conflict, you need to sit down and see each other's point of view. Talk about, okay, where are you coming from? Okay, this is where I'm coming from. Okay. Once you've understood that, you need to kind of get to the core of both, you know, both people's kind of issue. Once you have a core understanding of both people, then you might, okay, how can we come to the middle here? Okay. You think um, you need to take a drastic step for this. I think a much lot more easier, simple step can be taken. Okay. All right. Can we find a middle ground or can we bring someone in external who can give their idea that's not biased to anybody in the argument involved? Um, yeah, so it, it, it really, if it can't be solved within you, then you think about can we move on to somebody else and then solve the problem. All right. So, um, thinking of all those things there. I finish those questions. Once you're done, come back to me and we can move on to the next topic. Okay, 2.3. Collect sufficient evidence of the type and level of risk posed by the identified hazard. Um, bum, 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 bum. All right. So types of evidence may include your own and others' observations, job descriptions, procedures, manufacturers, guides and publications safety guidelines, records of accidents or near misses. Okay, for each of the following hazards, what evidence would you collect to assess the type of level of risks posed? So if we're thinking about, okay, we've got um, drawers, uh, drawers on a filing cabinet being left open. Why is it happening, first of all? Okay, we need to talk to everybody why this is happening. Is it a faulty drawer? Or is it that staff are not being trained properly to close the drawer? So it could be a mechanism issue where you, okay, um, you need to install a lock, otherwise the drawer is opening by itself. Or if it's a training issue, you need to train your staff into saying whenever these drawers are being opened, we need to close the filing cabinet so that it doesn't cause people harm. All right, next one, we've got wet floor in the hotel foyer after cleaning. So, you know, after you clean the floor, obviously it's going to be wet. So you, this is where you're taking preventative measures. So you're going to be cleaning at the lowest frequency, right? Instead of cleaning when it's really busy, you're going to be cleaning when almost nobody is there. Uh, you're going to be putting up signs that you're cleaning. You know, you're thinking about how do I make sure the floor dries really quickly maybe you use a a fan at the same time have the fans on fans going ac on um maybe you use a steam mop you know change up the way you clean the floor instead of using water maybe use steam so it's a bit hotter dries a bit quicker things like that um what else what else what else what else um okay Hot drinks, dispensers, we're thinking about, okay, um, right, steam me when empty, okay, so we're essentially talking about, um, you know, a faulty machine, has it been recorded, has the proper rectifications happened, who's been maintaining the machine, so you've got to look at all those things, okay. Food debris on the floor, in the kitchen. This is more of a process thing. You could take a photographic evidence or, you know, create a, um, an occurrence, you know, or record this happening that, you know, people have left food and then report to the correct section for cleaning. Or if it's your job, you'd have to clean it, but you would want to make sure that there's a record of it in place and you don't want it happening repetitively.
So you know, okay, if it's happening repetitively, why? And you've got evidence showing that you've taken note of this previously. Flies accessing food preparation areas. So this, um, again, you could do a, a hazard report. Um, our pest control call in for a pest control and then you would put in the proper documentation and then once you filed the documentation away you take the action that you wrote that you were going to take and move forward from there so complete that question unpause the video when you're ready and then we can move on to the next one 2.4 document the outcome of the risk assessment suggesting actions to eliminate or control risks keep records of risk assessments according to organizational procedures so we're thinking about what we can do to alleviate the risk so all the documentation you need to complete make sure it's clear readable uh, signed and dated so we can get back to whoever completed them um, Reports may include hazard reporting forms, uh, supervisor or deputies, OCE reports, incident reports, near miss reports, shift reports. So all these things we can use to compile our own report on the activities that may have happened leading to this hazard or risk or um, possible injury that may have happened. Uh, risk assessment records should fulfill these requirements demonstrating that there has been a comprehensive evaluation of risk detailing the people who have been affected including information about any actions that have been taken detailing the involvement of staff members and other business stakeholders so this could be your managers your customers business owners things like that Activity 2D, assume that you have carried out a risk assessment in relation to the following hazards. What actions can you suggest to eliminate the control of each risk? So we're talking about drawers, you know, training could be um, possibly lack of training for the staff. Wet floor using signage, better equipment so that we can, um, you know, use different methods or doing it at a um, be better time so people aren't walking on it as much hot drink dispenser so we can look at um, exchanging the equipment or having somebody come and repair or replace the equipment food debris on the floor in the kitchen obviously we'd clean it up straight away but then we would track back to why is it there who made the mess and in the future that it doesn't happen flies are accessing the food preparation area if any windows are open we'd close the windows uh, if there's you know we need to put mesh grills on there or install a uh, fly catcher or um, fly zapper we'd install that in the kitchen and then we'd call pest control if the you know issue got worse what might happen if records of risk assessments are not kept so you know there's a few things financially if somebody does get hurt you'll get sued and then if you you know don't have the funds to pay that person your business will go out you'll essentially be out of a job so that's your main thing if you don't have a job you're out on the street there so then you're you know thinking about um, what you know solutions you can give if you don't have a risk assessment you don't know what problems existed before and what they tried so now you might be trying the exact same thing that they did before but because there were no records, you're just wasting your time trying the same exact thing. Um, you know, you're trying to think about who was involved now, you're trying to use your memory or asking people. This this involves a whole other step. So you, if there is <coughs> risk assessments in place, you can use those documents and then plan out your approach to solving this instead of asking everybody and then um, seeing if they can remember the incident properly, you know, maybe a day or two later or even months later. Alright, so once you're done with that, complete those questions, come back, unpause the video, and we will move on to the next one. Okay, 3.1. Discuss ways of eliminating or controlling the risk with others. So, 
substituting a system of work or equipment with something safer you know think about even if it makes it a bit longer can the work be t done a bit safer okay isolating the hazard maybe quarantining the area so it's not so exposed and people are um, allowed to touch that equipment or get into that space um, introduce engineering controls adopting administrative controls so think about maybe you can buy new equipment or have somebody come and maintain that equipment so it doesn't cause the issues that it is causing now use personal protective equipment that's very important always if something can be avoided if, let's say the reason why we wear thick jackets is so when we do get hot oil splashback we're not getting huge burns on our skin and most uh, chef jackets you'll see um, and aprons they're all kind of thick in material so that's why I kind of um, give students a bit of a loose fit because we want them to be breathable and the tighter it gets they will feel more uncomfortable uh, implementing combined control methods to minimize risk so think about how we're going to use everybody's ideas and what the possible best idea we would end up with combining everybody's possible solutions Alright, discussing the matters with others require the following, good active listening, um, suspending your own views while others express theirs, letting others speak without interruption, encouraging others to contribute their ideas, being unafraid to voice your opinions and views. So, it's just being respectful, treat others like you'd respect, you know, you want to be treated, and I think if you give everybody an equal opportunity, they will voice their opinion and it's very you know, in rare cases where people feel threatened it's basically they may fear repercussions of saying certain things so if you just open up and say look it's a open space here nobody's gonna have any issues after we finish this meeting so speak as you would um, as I am somebody from your school not from the workplace you know, so voice your opinions, you're okay too, I'm your friend at this stage, we're not colleagues, let's just see how we can make the workplace safe for friends and um, let's get to the best outcome possible. Activity 3A, what is the important, uh, what is it, in, why is it important for others to be involved in decisions regarding the elimination of control of risks? Well, I've been talking to you about this the whole time, it's much better to have uh, differing opinions and different perspectives than to have just your own because maybe they have a better idea than you okay so you got to think about uh, often people would together will come up with a better solution because they can build upon each other's kind of ideas um, also it's you know you're getting their um, commitment to the solution so if they're not involved they don't really care they don't have anything attached to the outcome but you know if you're including them now they also have a stake in this so they're responsible as well so it kind of brings everyone together and ultimately like I said before the workplace is not safe for me it's safe for us so if we can do that as soon as possible it makes the work go a lot easier and a lot safer and less could get hurt what approaches can you use to encourage others to contribute to discussions about eliminating a controlling risk? So when we're, you know, thinking about the approach, we're thinking about, you know, talking it through. Um, are we going to be, um, you know, gen are we able to generate possible solutions? Are we allowing people to talk? you know uh, can we come up with multiple solutions and see if there is a better idea things like that so think about how you would really allow everybody involved to kind of bring out better solutions in the workplace what are the possible consequences if others are asked to contribute but their views are ignored so if they're you know if the person that's being asked is sharing their view and you're not listening or somebody else isn't listening, that's disrespectful, first of all. And secondly, they might have a good idea, but because 
you're not being respectful to them, you are losing out on that input. And now, that person doesn't want to contribute anymore because they've lost their interest because you were disrespecting them. So, if you're allowing them to contribute, they will contribute in the future and feel like it's an open space for them to bring up ideas and possible solutions for you. Ultimately, they will be able to solve the problem for you, if possible, compared to you having to create a solution by yourself. It's... If you're an ideas guy, it can be easy to come up with solutions. But if you're a guy that's a, let's say, you can get things done, but you're not great with ideas, you need people to come up with ideas for you, so then you can implement them. Okay? Um, you know, so, it's, and if you engage people, they feel attached to it. The more you ignore someone, they go, I'm not going to um, get involved in this anymore. This isn't something for me, so I don't really care. Alright, so fill in those questions in your workbook, uh, come back and then we can move on to the next one. So we got the last criteria, 3.2, take measures to eliminate or control risks. Um, measures that you can take to eliminate or control risks may include implementing control measures when reason responsible. Um, making suggestions for ways of eliminating or controlling risks, referring to a higher level of staff member for uh, decisions on implementing controls. So, if you're thinking about, you know, if you're the one that's responsible, you need to figure out a solution as soon as possible. So, if you're thinking about how can you eliminate them, what is the cheapest, the quickest, and the most effective way? Does it, is it a short-term solution or is it a long-term solution? And then if you can't come up with an idea, can somebody above you come up with a possible solution? And what can they suggest for you to move forward? Um, supporting the control measures, so work procedures, training, instructional videos, and um, other forms of information, supervision by higher-ups who've been trained in that. So then you can train the lower... Uh, staff below you. Um, it's important to provide support, especially if it's something to do with equipment, new equipment, or anything that's dangerous, because let's say you leave them on their own kind of um, skill and knowledge on that equipment. Maybe they know nothing, and now you're kind of disadvantaging them and yourself, because maybe they cut themselves, and now you're having to solve that problem and that uh, issue. So, train them, and then it really people will take on the responsibility if they feel like they know what to do. Most people will. It's just, you get those little few ones that don't really want to do it. And then essentially you, you need to tell them like I don't... That's when you kind of figure out that they're not made out for the job. Essentially. Okay, 3B. Yeah, I think this is going to be our last question. So before you guys move on to that one let you know that we've got the five assessments all together we've got the learner workbook which we have completed by now and then we've got the multiple choice questions which are on online and you'll submit then we've got the knowledge questions practical and skill assessments that we'll do so don't forget about those if you have got any questions don't forget to email me if you um, or your you know, respect the trainers with the questions and they'll direct you to the best possible solution. Um, if you're talking about, you know, if you missed out on something or if you're confused, you're more than welcome to come back to this video or come back to this lecture and kind of re... I don't know what I say, re, re learn what you haven't or just learn about what you, you're confused about. Okay, so let's finish off the activity. What general measures can be taken to eliminate or control safety risks? So think about what can we do simply first of all. Okay, so maybe we can substitute one of the tasks for another. Maybe we can isolate the hazard. Okay. Um, maybe we can uh, have somebody fix the problem. Come in or engineer a solution for it. Maybe we can um, if maybe wearing PPE might solve the problem. So there's many, many things that you can do to eliminate and control risks. Okay. Uh, take an example of hazards. 
identified earlier or generate a new example, identify a range of possible actions to eliminate the risk for each option, outline a, a brief plan for implementing the actions you recommended. So you pick anything, okay? Let's say if we pick the, the drawer, and then the drawers are constantly being left open of the cabinet, and we need to make sure that they're not, so they're not hurting anybody. So first, in any situation, you would prepare a briefing for the staff okay for the meeting or whatever right? then what you do you'd conduct the briefing and um, you know you would start and get everybody to sign and let's say you you say okay we're gonna get trained this is the problem we need training on this you conduct the training okay and then everybody shows that they're okay with doing that and now you've got your plan in place then make arrangements if people aren't getting it, how would you rectify that? Then set up another meeting to see if the meet, if the training has worked for you and everybody. Okay, so it's kind of simple. If it's somewhere where the team is smaller, maybe you can't do that. So um, you know you'd uh, do it in a smaller scale. So think about um, having a meeting again and then just conducting the the risk assessment with it, then thinking about what you can do to rectify it, then follow through with your proposed actions and see if it's worked, if it's worked, great, if it's not then what else could you do to rectify the issue and eliminate the risk. Okay, so once you guys have answered that, um, we've still got the other assessments left, if you've got any questions or any feedback, get in touch with me. My email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au. Um, just shoot an email and I'll try and answer it as best as possible. Alright, so it's done for this one. I'll see you in the next one.